Good evening, Church of the Good Shepherd. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to deliver this message to you. Um, I was myself convicted by some of these things here, and so um, let's see if I can deliver it to the best of my ability. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you're in our midst, um, no matter the situation, in this tough situation right now. Um, we thank you that you're here with us, that you preside over everything that we do and say. Um, help us to understand this concept of sin a little bit better. Um, help me to do um, a, a, an adequate job in delivering this message about sin and um, what we can do about that sin in our lives. Thank you for the atonement again, um, I, going to the cross and providing the provision um, that you did. Help us to appropriate that grace each day as we live. Um, help us to grow in grace. Help us to grow in you and to understand your word better. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we finished off last week um, in Cain and Abel's story. Uh, uh, Abel is still alive. Uh, we left him alive last week. Um, he's not going to have that um, same um, comfort this week. Um, Cain will follow through with his... Um, growing sin and, uh, and uh, represent the first murder on this new earth. Um, and I left off by saying that Cain's sin, uh, if you wonder what he did wrong or what he did right or what Abel did right, um, Cain's sin was virtually uninterrupted. Um, he showed impiety, anger, jealousy. He was a complainer. He deceived. He was a murderer. He showed falsehood. Uh, he was self-seeking, and he showed self-pity at the very end when he's judged. Um, not very good qualities. Um, but you see, on the eve, or right before the murder, God made overtures to him. And that's been the theme of my lesson here. God made overtures at this late date to this sinner. And I said, note the loving, gracious attitude and behavior that God displays towards Cain. In Genesis 4, 6, and 7, I've read that more than a couple of times. It'll come up again today. Note that God did not punish Cain, that, that he did not punish Cain uh, after he offered an unacceptable sacrifice. He simply told him that it was unacceptable. He gave him a chance to amend that behavior. Um, he now gives Cain another chance to redeem himself, wipe away his anger and hate, and the very seeds of the murder to come. Uh, here are some verses, though, uh, that tell us that it's possible for Cain to have reversed the situation. It is possible for Cain to repent at this point and do what God expects, but the enemy is poised to devour him if he chooses not to. Let me read you some verses uh, that, that speak about this issue. And then I want to get to um, the issue of sin itself as an entity, as a predator. Uh, not too dissimilar to what we did with Samson. Okay. Ephesians 4.27 Do not let the sun go down while you are angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Something to think about, something that Cain could have done. Resist the devil in James 4, 7, and he will flee from you. There's a way to combat his advances. Be sober, 1 Peter. Be sober, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Same verses I probably read with Samson. Um, issue is the same, different names. Names. Proverbs 28, 15, like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked man ruling over a helpless people. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation. Uh, yours is not, Cain's is not different than mine, nor different than yours, nor different than what, con when con what confronted Jesus when he was on earth. Did Jesus have the ability to fail his temptation in the desert? Yes. Yes, it wouldn't have been a temptation otherwise. He had the ability to fail. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He's always faithful. 
He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Psalm 65, 3. Our iniquities are stronger than we are. We're helpless. We're hopeless. And then there's something else after the comma. But you forgive our transgressions. And then there's a, a Psalm 119, 11. Cain could not master sin's desire by his own strength, but with God's word in his heart, as this Bible verse says, and a decision of faith to obey God and not his own feelings, he could have drawn on God's strength and mastered it. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You had to have done that before. Cain had to come prepared for this struggle, to this conflict, with that word hidden in his heart for that to be successful. Now something about sin itself. Um, most of this was delivered by Tim Keller uh, as he speaks in Manhattan every Sunday. Um, and I think it's, it's the best uh, presentation on sin that I've ever seen. The Bible is not primarily a, a set of disconnected individual stories, but it has one storyline. It's about sin and how it changed the world and his, uh, his prized possession man and what God is going to do about it. We begin to trace this out by starting with the story of Cain and Abel. The Bible's simple answer to the question, what's wrong with the human race? Why don't we get along? Why is there war? Why is there so much trouble? Uh, the answer is sin. Contemporary people cringe and wince and have, get a tick when you say the word sin. Uh, the London Times recently said, it's about time that we banned the words sin and evil. They're the reason why we have problems. They're empty and obsolete. But what vocabulary will you use to talk about war atrocities, injustice, hate, strife, slavery, violence? What will you use besides sin? What language can you use? Will you use the language of technology, sociology, or psychology? Will you talk about maladaptive behavior or dysfunction? That's not sufficient. The language we have in those disciplines isn't profound enough, it's not inclusive enough to deal with the realities of what's going on in our world. Um, it's better to look at what the Bible says. It's sin. And without God's help, when we get on that path, it's irretrievable. We learn more about what the Bible means by this term sin by looking at this sad and poignant narrative, the famous story of Cain and Abel. Let's look at what the Bible says is wrong with us. Uh, there's a potency of sin. There's a subtlety of sin. And then, thank, thankfully, there's the ultimate demise of sin that's spoken about in Genesis 3.15. In verse 7, God, in speaking to Cain, uses a remarkable image. He says to Cain, but you're going on this path, you're going towards murder, you're already at hatred, which is an akin, akin to murder, um, but, if you do, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. We're going to have more of that in a little bit. But you must master it. It's a remarkable image. It's the image of a leopard, a tiger, a predatory animal, crouching in the shadows, coiled and ready to spring and kill. Something that's beyond your ability to fight. Sin is predatory. Sin has a deadly life of its own. How is that? Here, right away, we're going to see why there is no other set of vocabulary words besides sin. First, when God uses this image, he's telling us that sin has an abiding, growing, real presence in your life, in our lives. If you commit sin, sin is not over. Sin is not simply an action you do. It's a force. It's a power. It has a life unto its own. It takes shape, a shadowy shape, and stays with you and begins to affect you. Eventually, it can take you out. You say, well, how can that be? You can start with the psychological concept of habit. You can start there, 
But it doesn't end there. You can start by noticing things we do become easier to do again and again, and easier to do again and again, and harder to stop doing. It's much more than habitual. It's slavery. C.S. Lewis, I, I really love this passage here. C.S. Lewis, some years ago, wrote this passage in one of the chapters of Mere Christianity. He says, that explains what always used to puzzle me about Christian writers. They seem to be so very strict at one moment and so very free and easy at another. They talk about mere sins of thought, grievances between people, gossip, as if they were immensely important. Then they talk about the most frightful murders, and if you only get to repent, all of it would be forgiven. Why would you liken hate to murder? Why would you liken gossip to murder? They're not the same. One is worse than the other, not in God's eyes. I have come to see, this is Tim Kellis saying this, that they are right. What they're always thinking of is the mark. It's the scar that's left on the soul after each sin. Each of us would have to endure that scar forever. One man may be so placed that his anger sh sheds the blood of thousands just because of situational differences. Another so placed with his anger that he only becomes a laughingstock. It's just happenstance he doesn't kill thousands. If given the chance, that man with hate in both instances would have. Here are two people. They both get angry. One of them, because of the condition, has the power to kill people with it. The other person, no matter how angry he gets, people just laugh. It's the same case, the same disease in both cases. Each has done something to himself which, unless he repents, will make it harder to keep him out of that rage next time. In Mere Christianity, again, C.S. Lewis makes the interesting observation that first, the Nazis killed the Jews because they hated them. After a while, they hated the Jews because they had killed them. Here's the point. When you sin, when Cain sins, when we sin, it doesn't just go away with that one sin. The sin becomes a presence in your life. You start by doing sin, but then sin does you. It becomes your master. You can decide, I'm not going to forgive my mother. I'm not going to forgive my father for what he or she has done. Okay, you think you're done with it, but then it will do you because that will poison your relationship with other people, certain people in all kinds of ways you can't even anticipate. It will harden you. It has a life of its own. It, it seems to me by reading Tim Keller's um, uh, sermon here, uh, parts of it, um, this is an important decision for us to make and to get right. It was important. God spoke to him on the eve of the murder. God makes overtures to each of us on the eve of our sin. This is the reason why legal terminology is not enough. While it creates bad habits or psychological problems, we must go for, for, further. When it talks about sin as a crouching tiger or a hidden dragon, when it talks about sin like that, it says, for example, in Galatians 6, 7th and 8th verse, sin will find you out. You reap what you sow. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Do you know what that means? Sin also creates a presence not just in you, but around you. It affects others. It sets up strains in the fabric of things, the way God made the world, especially in the human community. Haters breed more hatred. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. When you sin, the sin becomes a presence in your life. It takes a shape in and around you, and it will take you out. Remember, Samson, it will enslave you, it will blind you, it will become your master, it will kill you. Same thing, sin hasn't changed. Therefore, you should avoid sin like the plague, because it is a plague. You know, you might hear somebody say to somebody, else, um, you have three broken bones in your leg, um, doctor does an x-ray, three broken bones in your leg, you ought to do something about that, and you say, well, one of these years I've been thinking of going to have that fixed. You don't do that. You should not do the same thing with sin. 
Someone says you have an abrasive spirit or you can't control yourself in this area. You have a character flaw or this and that. You can't say, so what? It's more insidious than those broken bones. The idea of sin crouching at the door not only tells us it's coiled to spring, it also tells us that sin has the ability to hide, to not be visible at all times. See the lion, the tiger, the leopard is crouching. That means down away out of your sight. Why? If you could see that enemy coming, you could protect yourself against him. But no, you can't. It's a shadow, it's a presence, it's a predator, and it's hidden. What that means in the, in the worst things in your life, the character flaws and the sins that are most going to ruin you, uh, or, or, running, or ruining you already, it makes the people around you, not only you, miserable as well. The character flaws, the least um, that we admit to, are going to get us. They're going to do us in. They're the ones you're in denial about. You rationalize and you minimize. By definition, those are the crouching sins in your life. As long as you look at being a workaholic as conscientiousness, as long as you look at your grudge as moral outrage, as long as you look at materialism as ambition or arrogance as healthy self-assertion, you're vulnerable. You're in denial. Sin will get you. What are the crouching sins in your life? Do you not have a short list of character flaws you know have power over you, but you tend to rationalize and minimize? You know many of us get to this spot. The ones of us that don't get to this spot are already, have already been, fell prey to, the, to this uh, to sin. The subtlety of sin. This brilliant narrative shows how subtle it is. Because you have Cain and you have Abel. They seem indistinguishable one from the other. But the Bible and the New Testament um, helps, uh, especially, tells us they're not the same. What do they represent? They re represent the people who call on God's name and find favor with him. And then the people who reject God. Each given the same choice. Again, we're back to choices. You don't see one person, Cain or Abel, working hard, another person living off welfare. That's not what you have. What do you have? The only difference is one seems to be a farmer, the other is a rancher, from what we can tell. One is giving an offering from the first fruits, the fat portions of the first fruits, the other is giving some part of his vegetable and fruit garden. They're both offering to God. What's the difference? They're both doing God's will. They're both seeking God. But the Bible tells us otherwise. Despite all of our guesses about what this story means, what it represents, they are not the same. God commends Abel for his sacrifice. He looked on, on Cain's with disfavor. What's the problem? All we're told is God blessed and showed favor to Abel, and he didn't favor Cain. There must be some matter of the heart going on here. There is. The narrative gets you to investigate. It gets you to think, and that's what Bible study is about. Here are some clues to the answer. And I've already read that. Uh, Cain uh, brought some fruits as an offering, um, but Abel brought the fat portions of the firstborn of the flock. He brought the premier pieces. He brought, he brought the ones that he would sorely miss. There are people who are pretty calculating and make absolutely sure that they give God just what they need to just enough to do their duty. Then there's the kind of person who is open-hearted, the able. They're not calculating. There's a joy in giving. There's an abandon. They love the God they're sacrificing to. You don't see that in Cain. In Hebrews 11, we're told Abel made his sacrifice and offering in faith. Cain did not. Well, what do you think? Cain didn't have faith in God? Cain didn't believe God existed? I think he did. He was speaking to God on the eve of his murder. He really knows God exists. So what else could be going on? God hasn't given this first family a whole lot of information about how, how he's going to redeem the, the, the world. He suggested in Genesis 3.15 that something is coming that will change the picture, the sinful picture. 
He has promised to save the world. That's all we know. It's pretty vague. It's awfully basic. There are two reasons you might bring an offering to God. To thank Him for what He's done, for the plan of salvation that's coming, or just out of obligation. Gratitude towards salvation was Abel's drive. The other reason is to do it as a means of salvation, as a way of getting God to bless you, as a way of getting God to reward you, to answer your prayers, and then ultimately take you up to heaven. You don't see the difference between Cain and Abel on the surface. They're both hardworking. They're both going to church. One is grumpy. He's angry. He's furious. Cain, always mad with the world, ends up killing Abel. What's the difference? The Lord says to Cain after he kills Abel, where is your brother? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It overshadows, it foreshadows rather, the victory that Jesus has over sin. His blood's going to call up from the ground and it's going to declare man innocent if they repent because of that blood. God asks you a question. When God asks you a question, sorry, I can guarantee one thing. He's not looking for information. He has all the information about your situation that is needed. He's not trying to understand your heart. He understands it completely. If God asks you a question, he's trying to get you to understand your heart. Cain, why are you downcast? Why are you angry? If you do what's right even now, can't you change things? He's not asking a real question. He knows the situation. And before the murder, he says to Cain, I see you're downcast. Your face has fallen, which is actually an idiomatic expression for depression. He is counseling a depressed man. He's asking one more time if Cain will turn around. At this late date, God cares, God cares. He is pursuing him. He is trying to get him to understand his own heart. Look at the tenderness of it. What amazes me, even though he is telling him the truth, he says, look, Cain, it's not Abel's fault that you're depressed, that you're angry. It's not my fault. It's your own actions and your own attitudes that have caused the problem. But you can change that at this late date. Your brother's, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What does that mean? All through the Bible, there are places where God says, the innocent shed blood is crying to me from the ground. God is a God of mercy and grace. He's also a God of justice. It means when injustice is done, it cries to God as it were. There's an outcry. Years later, another man showed up who was a lot like Abel. He came into the world, he came into a nation filled with Cain's, people who were religiously very observant, who were always bringing their offerings, honoring the sacrificial system, and yet they hated his spirit. They slew him. The book of Hebrews says, when Jesus Christ died, his blood, an innocent victim of injustice, his blood cried out, but in a new way. He became a mediator. He became the payment for my sin. Jesus was, in fact, the ultimate Abel because he was the only person who was truly innocent who came into the world. He was not a grumpy Cain. Jesus is standing before the throne of the Father and saying, Father, your law demands justice, but I present myself instead of those people. These people have sinned. The wages of sin is death, but for all the people who believe in me, I have paid for it. There can't be a double payment for this sin. There is my blood crying out for justice. Here's how it cries now. Justice demands that you not condemn my believing brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm grateful for that overture. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I've needed that many times, and I will need it before my days are finished. If you really knew, if you really know that, they are, that you're secure in his love, if that moves you to the depths, it shakes you to the depths, and it moves you to tears, 
You're not going to be a grumpy Cain anymore. You're not going to always be comparing yourself to other people. You're not going to be angry because someone is getting ahead of you. You'll understand why your offering was not favored. Cain and his kind are as miserable as can be. Sin is mastering them. But the gospel of the grace of God can deal with sin in our lives, in your life. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Go and learn what that means. Spend the rest of your life learning what that means. I, I think that's written especially for me. I'm going to try to do that. So I just read you uh, about the enemy being poised, the verses that pertain to that. I'm going to continue. The righteous, wicked state of Cain's heart would not accept reparations. The eve of his murder, right before his murder, God makes overtures. I've read plenty about that. Um, and by his actions, Cain says, absolutely not. I want none of your grace. I want none of it. He deceives Abel into going to a field and promptly murders him. It's the quickest murder story you've ever read. Note the sir. Does he change after the murder of his brother Abel? No. Note that this is, this is why they're in contrast. It's not just one act. It's the whole life of Cain. It's the whole life of Abel. They're going different paths. They've chosen different masters. Note the surly response to God's question in Genesis 4-9. Where's your brother? How am, I, how am I supposed to know? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, the first two boys put on earth, I would think you would know where he is. He knew where he, he, knew where he was. If it is the answer of a disrespectful teen to a parent, an unrepentant heart, who even at this late stage chooses death instead of life. And that's exactly what he did. Um, his physical death was not imminent, um, but his spiritual death was. If Cain's fate were predetermined for him, why would God have made his overture? Why spend this time, why spend this valuable time with Cain trying to persuade him to see things differently? He would not take the overture for repentance. Even after Cain is punished, he remains unrepentant and filled with self-pity. He's, he's banished, and in Genesis 4.13, he says, My punishes, punishment is more than I can bear. And the loving Lord bows to him and says, Okay, um, here's what I'll do. I'll put a mark on you. Anybody who hurts you, um, they'll be cursed. Um, and just as for who would hunt down uh, Cain, uh, if there's only Adam and Eve alive and Cain, um, Abel is dead, who would, don't forget, there are other children. Look at the verses, Genesis 4, 17. Cain had a wife, therefore Adam and Eve had to have other children. And in 5, 4, it makes it clear that before and after Seth, there were children from Adam and Eve. So there could have been children, uh, nieces and nephews that would hunt Cain. There was much to be afraid of. Um, he should have been afraid of God's wrath, but he wasn't. Today is the time, final thought here, with a bunch of verses after it. Today is the time of God's favor. When is the time for Cain to turn it around? He's gone. He's already elected. When is the time for you to turn it around, for me to turn it around, to bring forth even those small flaws in our characters, and lay them on the altar. Today. Today is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6.2. Listen to this commentary from Charles John Ellicott on 2 Corinthians 6.2. For each church and nation, for every individual soul, there is a golden present, as for as time, not gifts, which may never again recur. Today is the day to respond to God's offer of grace. There is no more opportune time than the present. Maybe Cain didn't know how close he was. Uh, Isaiah 49, 8. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. And that's quoted in part in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, which I just read. Acts 3, 19. 
Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Um, ever think that there's a burden, that there's a yoke that comes with being a Christian, repenting? Uh, there's a freedom. This is real freedom. I can, see, I can see, I can hear Richie Havens singing freedom. Um, this is real freedom. This is not just political freedom, um, economic freedom. This is real freedom. Hebrews 2.3 how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? How indeed. Psalm 95, 7 and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did at Meribah, one of the many rebellions in the desert. Uh, they were always rebelling because they were always with sin. They never saw themselves in the, in the mirror of God's grace. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. Do you see how patient he was with Cain? Uh, I don't completely understand that. He knows what's going to happen. He's still being patient with Cain. He's still trying to get him to repent. He still wants to salvage one soul. How can that be? I don't understand that. Um, but here it is, side by side in the scripture. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I love that word, everyone. It's an open, it's an open um, uh, invitation. Uh, Romans 1, 28 to 32. Uh, too much paper. Furthermore, this is long, um, but it's a warning. And I read it last because... Um, it's a warning. It's supposed to stick with us. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, the world of today. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, Boastful, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. You ever hear of an exhaustive list like that? Although such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Tragically, is my comment on that, those verses. Tragically, there is a point of no return. He is the God of grace, but there is a point of no return, as per that verse. God may eventually stop trying to bring the chronically rebellious to repentance and give them over to their own ways. We never know when this point of no return is. So the better part of wisdom is timely repentance. God allowed sin to run its course as an act of judgment. Um, I think more often than not, it's the person, their conscience becomes so seared, they have no use for the gospel any longer. They can't even hear it. They're incapable of comprehending what's being said. I have a couple more. Oh, that was my last one. Here I'm going to um, let me make sure that's true. Yes. I want to read you this, this song. Um, if there is a time uh, to, to think about repentance, to think about responding to the call, um, pretend for a moment um, that you're Cain, that God has approached you um, and said, uh, I don't like what I see in you. Um, perhaps he's done that today. Perhaps he's done that through this uh, whole COVID um, episode. Uh, he's brought something to your attention. Um, it wouldn't be a wise idea to wait until we're gathering together in full force to bring your um, sins to the altar, when Brother Ernie calls us, and make it right then. Today is the approved day. Today is the day of grace. 
Uh, I tried to, to choose wisely. Uh, I came to this hymn softly and tenderly. Um, God speaks with a soft voice. He's very tender, but his message is one um, that's unassailable, meaning you can't negotiate these terms. Um, this is the way it's going to be. Um, the day of grace is today. Um, it, this, this song deserves to be sung. I wouldn't dare try that. Um, I'm going to read it. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Pretend, pretend these words are written only for you. Um, nobody else listening. Um, if I have one viewer this week and you're the one, this is written to you. Um, I have often done this. I'm making that um, attempt right now to speak this to my own soul. Um, I need these words, all of these words, more than anybody else. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. I'm going to read each verse and then one chorus. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? There's question marks there. Consider this is what the writer is saying. Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. There's, there's one avenue, there's one only one avenue, it's putting Jesus in the place of yourself. Jesus has already done that. Now you have to appropriate that work on the cross. It awaits your response. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Um, I, I would ask that Everybody at home, if you can just read this chapter one more time and try to let the words of the gospel, of the, of the Bible, speak to you directly, rather than hear it through me, if I've done any poor job here and, and not explained things well, allow the Bible to speak to you. Um, you can't be untouched once you read these words. Um, we're going to uh, probably consider the... Um, the uh, prophet, the priest, the leader, the military leader, Samuel, uh, next week. Thank you for your attention.